OK, so my talk, it's not continuous delivery if you can't deploy right now. Basically, the idea here is that you know, words have meanings. And might be doing really good automated build and test, you know, what have you. But if there's not a system that you can log into and push a button right now to deploy to production, then it's not quite continuous delivery yet. OK, so who am I? Uh, I'm a technology evangelist for ThoughtWorks, which just means that I get paid to fly around and do this, which is kind of cool. Great job. Um, I do want to tell you that this is going to be pretty opinionated. So I come from a company that's very opinionated. Just some of the books written by uh, current and former employees. So I'm going to go into some things and say, this is the way I think it should be done. Doesn't mean it's the only right answer. There is no one right way, I don't think. But it's ways that have worked really, really well for us. OK, so why this talk? Um, so I've been with ThoughtWorks a little over eight years um, and was on like, our continuous delivery products for the entire time, for the most part. So I've seen a lot of deployment pipelines and CI and CD and so forth out in the market. And I would hear quite often, say, yep, we got a continuous delivery pipeline, no problem. I just have to give it to the security team, and then three months later I can deploy. Um, you know, or, or what have you. And so it was still very siloed. It was still you know, just better continuous integration, not quite continuous delivery. And so the point of this talk is there to show you, it's going to be fairly high level, because we're going to cover a lot of things. But here's some types of testing that you might not be doing in your CD um, pipeline. Here's some code management strategies you might, might be thinking about, some deployment strategies you might not be thinking about. Um, not going to go terribly in depth on any of them. Be around the whole two days if we want to go more in depth. But the idea is, your takeaway is, wow, I didn't think that I should be doing that kind of testing as part of my automation. Because you, know, you really, the purpose of a continuous delivery pipeline is to kill a release candidate. Okay? It, you can't prove something's good, but you can absolutely prove it's bad. So if I, code, if I do a commit, that's a release candidate. And if all my tests pass, I should be so confident in my pipeline that if I wanted to, I can push deploy. And that's the purpose of a CD pipeline. Um, and just because we want to do a Star Wars thing, because I'm a geek. Um, it's real, that's what I mean. There's, there's not a halfway, and it, but there's also a never done. So you have to do these things. It's an ongoing thing. Don't just try. Just do it. OK, so why continuous delivery? So before I want to get into why we do it a certain way, why is it important to us? Um, lots of people are familiar with the Agile Manifesto. Um, Alistair's here. Um, a lot of people haven't read page two. You know, it's funny. The term continuous delivery is commonly attributed to Jez Humble and Dave Farley, who wrote a book by the same title. And in fact, it comes from page two of the manifesto. And so if we go all the way back to Agile, you know, our goal was supposed to be continuous delivery of valuable software. Um, but we, as an industry, put in good build and test like CI practices, and we had our release candidate, and then it got handed to somebody else. So we didn't actually deliver software to customers. And so that's, I think, continuous delivery is kind of, in you know, the DevOps culture is kind of finishing what Agile started. And just because of that, I pulled out a slide that I used doing Agile training about 15 years ago. Why do CD? Because partially done might still be useful. There might be functionality that's done that I can make use of and make money off of. Most of us are in those kinds of organizations. And so this is literally a slide from Agile training, where you don't paint the Mona Lisa that way, you paint it this way. And continuous delivery is the same thing. If I can get features into customers' hands at the very earliest times, I can get real feedback on, is this going the right way? Um, you want to have fun. I didn't do a slide of it. Look up an x-ray of the blue man. It's a famous painting. But they did an x-ray to show all the, the versions of the painting before it came what it is. You know, now it's one of those $20 million paintings, but it did not start out um, to what it is. So we want to get value sooner. Um, the other reason is hackers aren't going away. You know, it's getting worse. And so if, if I have a system where I can go in and update a library, if I can go in and up, op, update OpenSSL and be in production in 20 minutes, that's a very good thing. And you, you, you have to make sure everything else is right in your pipeline before you can really safely do that. Uh, when, this, when Heartbleed came out a couple years ago, um, a lot of companies, oh my gosh, they logged into production, and they updated their SSL libraries, and so now they're safe, but their applications didn't work. Because the change didn't go through all the testing. It's just when somebody logged into production. Um, Thou shalt not have root. <laughs> and I'll go more into Knight Capital. Who knows Knight Capital? Yay, only a couple. I'll go into Knight Capital in a minute as the reason why you should have this. 
So I want to talk a little bit about continuous integration. You cannot do continuous delivery if you're not doing really good continuous integration, full stop. So fix this first if you're not doing this yet. Uh, we talk a lot about something we call CI theater. This is where um, you know, I got a CI server and I have a few unit tests and you know, OK here and there. Um, but I'm not really doing all the things. And I'm going to go into what the things are here in a little bit. So you're probably not really doing continuous integration. We actually did a study a couple, couple of years ago where we went out and interviewed a bunch of people and said, are you doing CI? Yes, OK, let's talk about your process. Only 10% of people would even acknowledge, you know, oh, I have a CI server. I have you know, Go CDRs. I have Jenkins. I have Bamboo. I have, we're doing CI. Having a product and doing continuous integration are two different things. <laughs> okay, and so there's things that have to be done here, um, and, and you know it goes back to extreme programming principles. It's test-driven development. It's pair programming. It's those kinds of things to make it solid. A couple of those practices. Did anybody bring in raw fruit? I hope not. Don't throw it at me. I'm going to go into some opinionated stuff now. If you're doing feature branching, you are not doing continuous integration. Okay, you might be doing really good automated build and test, and that might work great for you. And okay, that's fine. But continuous integration means building off trunk, trunk-based development, master development, what have you. And it's important to continuous integration. You'll see why when we get into deployment methodologies. But I do want to go into this a little bit, because this one's controversial. So here we have Professor Plum and Reverend Green. And Pro Professor Plum's working on her code, and she's doing some things. And we're doing bug fixes on mainline. And you know, she's bringing those in, and that's working good. And then Reverend Green's over there, and he's working on his things. And he's bringing in bug requests. And everything's good. And then eventually, one of them finishes first. And so Professor Plum finishes, merges back into mainline, trunk, master, whatever you want to call it. Everything's good. Then Reverend Green does a git pull. And we have this massive merge conflict. Um, I like to joke the technical term for that's the big ball of mud. Now, we all know there are really good merge conflict tools out there. I can find the text differences and say, choose this one and that one, you know, et cetera. But they don't look at intent. They don't say this is why the code changed. Or you know, that person's an American, so they used feet. And that person's from Europe, so they used meters. You know, or what have you. They don't talk about intent. And so we strongly believe the right way to do this is to be pushing and pulling to master at least once a day. So I work on my code. I commit it to master trunk. Mainline, again, whatever you want to call it. The continuous integration, continuous delivery server is watching that. Not watching all the feature branches necessarily. It could. But the branches, you know, you might work on it for a few weeks, but you're pushing your changes to master every single day. Um, we've stolen this term a lot, but Benji, I, it was the first time I saw it. It may have been used further. Um, so when everybody has their own branch and their own work and what have you, we call that continuous isolation. So you can run all the tests, but it's really not continuous integration, because the word integration means integrated code. So from a CI perspective, what I really want to encourage you to do is commit more often. You, I mean, at least once a day, and, more, and faster is better. Uh, you know, if, if, I, if I'm committing constantly, and there's things we have to do in the code to make it so we can do that, and the tests fail, I have that much less code to go through to find why it failed. Something hurts, do it more often. Again, I, I, we stress trunk-based development a lot. Uh, I forgot to put the link up there, but if you go to trunkbaseddevelopment.com, uh, a site that we didn't create, but it goes very in a lot of detail about why and how you can do it and some of the benefits and uh, strategies, et cetera. It's from a, a gentleman who, who used to work for us. Um, but he's done this in very large projects, and it really works. And then automate all the things. So with that, and I said fast moving, but I'll have questions at the end, by the way. I mentioned at the beginning that there's a lot of things that um, people say, oh, we're doing continuous delivery. We just have to give it to this team or that team. Uh, I live in Seattle in the United States, and I was at a customer, and I said, yeah, we deploy once a week, and that's fast enough for us. I'm like, cool. So if you had a change in your code today, it would be a week to get into production. Well, no, there's a six-month hardening cycle. So they deployed once a week, but it was dev complete from six months ago. And so it doesn't quite count. Um, who here could get code into production today if you had to? Awesome. That's, way, that's going up. That's great. Um, Mary Popendick used to start doing that question when she was doing Lean Talks 
five or 10 years ago, and nobody could do it in one day. They all had reproof cycles and what have you. So on your continuous integration, continuous delivery server, there's some testing that you may not be doing that you may want to consider. So first off is security. How many people do security testing as a part of their automation in CI, CD? Yeah, only, what, 5% maybe at that. There's lots of things you can be doing. Now, don't get me wrong. There, I have a friend, Jason, who sits around in a dark room and does pen testing, and you don't want to replace Jason. He's really, really, really good at that. But there are a lot of things you can automate. Um, there's actually pre-commit things. So there's an open source product, I think it's called Talisman, um, and I will publish all the references, by the way, that the developers have to put on their own machine. And you can do commits, but when you do a git push, it runs Talisman against it. And if you have an Amazon key or any of that stuff in there, it's not getting pushed. You know, because if something touches GitHub, you're done. That key has to be replaced. I don't, if it's there for a millisecond, you're done. Um, and so test for that. Make, you know, put it on the developers, because mistakes happen. Oops, went to one too far, sorry. So Sonatype is a company that runs um, Maven Central. So if there's any Java developers that use Maven and your project, um, they did a study that the, most of the people that use Maven, so people using open source Java stuff, was 106 components. On average, 24 of them had known vulnerabilities that had been fixed. But when they set up Maven, they said, get this library version 2 and get that library version 3. And meanwhile, library version 12 has been out for years. But they don't know that. Um, and so, I mean, you know, what is that? Almost 20, 22%, 20%? Um, it's scary. <laughs> and I mean, there, there's tools for these. I, I'm blanking on the one for Java, but if you're using Ruby and gem files, it's called Breakman. If you do a pull request to the product I work on, on GitHub, the CI tool is going to run all the unit tests, and you can watch all that. But meanwhile, we're running Breakman. Make sure you didn't use any gems that, are, that have this problem. So you can do that. Um, sorry, the uh, formatting got a little bit changed. But um, there's also a lot of tools now that can do UA-based, and they can do SQL injections and do cross-site scripting and all that automated. These tools, there's open source ones. They're, they're, even the commercial tools aren't that expensive, depending on your scale, your definition of expensive. These are all things that should be in your pipeline. Okay, so every code commit gets security tested. Anybody doing performance testing in their pipeline? Even fewer than security. Yeah. Amazon did a study, um, and you know, Amazon has 300,000 employees right now. They're about to hit a market cap of a trillion dollars. So they're kind of good at what they do. But they figured out that half a second in response time makes a 50% cost of business. So if it's the you know, website slows down that much, people will leave, and they'll go buy it somewhere else. Performance is massive to your business success. Test it. These are going to be really rudimentary for anyone that's done any kind of performance testing, but I want to go over some of them real quick, because some of them are easier to do in a pipeline than others. Um, so load testing is just what it is. You know what, you can have this many clients, they do the access, what happened? You know, you look at CPU percentage. That's, pretty, that's one's easy. Um, stress testing is a little bit harder. Stress testing is, let's pretend web-based app, just because, pretend. So we have our app, and I do 10 clients, 20, 50, 100, 200, 300, 500, crash, okay. My stress test says I can do up to 550. So if I'm gonna launch a new product in November in, in the western part of the world, I probably need to know that and have capacity planning ready for that. Again, that can all be automated. I have never seen this in a pipeline um, outside of ThoughtWorks. Soak test. Run something for two or three days and see if there's a memory leak. Test those kinds of things, okay? Now, if you're doing continuous deployment, which is defined as I commit code, a whole bunch of automated stuff runs, and if everything passes, it goes to production, then you probably don't want to do a three-day soak test, okay? But if you're doing continuous delivery, which is my code can be deployed at any time and a human makes the choice. Okay, if you're an on-premise product, a mobile product, something like that where you're not pushing it every day, you can put soak test. It's not gonna soak test every change because it's gonna do a change, it's gonna run three days of testing, and then the next whole group of changes, you know, et cetera. You don't wanna do first in, first out. You wanna grab all the things for the latest one. But you can do this in a pipeline. 
And then spike testing, again, depends on your industry, this may not matter, but you have 10 clients, and now you throw 1,000 at it and see what happens. Now here's the thing. We all say, those of us who do you know, DevOps continuous delivery talks, um, fast feedback. The whole point of this is to, to fail fast, to get feedback very, very fast. And so people are like, wait, this test takes days, and this one takes at least hours, and I'm gonna slow my whole pipeline down. You know, I can't do that, I'm not gonna, you just said, can I get production into code, you know, into code into production today? Not if I have a three-day spike test, or soak test, sorry. You should be able to do this stuff in parallel. Okay, so I do some unit tests, that builds my basic deployable unit. And then uh, separate environments automatically. Put it on the functional test, the load test, the spike test, the fast things, and I don't know if you can see the arrows very well, but you know, those are saying that these three all have to pass or my staging deployment's not gonna run, okay? But the purpose of a staging deployment is to test the deployment on production-like hardware. So if you're deploying to Solaris in a cluster using Oracle, then your staging environment needs to be Solaris in a cluster using Oracle. It might only be three servers instead of 1,000, but it needs to look the same. I can tell you that if ThoughtWorks had done this on a project I won't name in 2006, the continuous delivery server would, or continuous delivery book, excuse me, would not exist. We were building a Java project. All the developers had Windows laptops. They didn't get Solaris machines, which was the ultimate deployment target, until six months in. They got the machines, deployed the software, it didn't work. I don't mean it had deployment problems, it did not start. Um, turns out they used a way to access the file system that NFS and Solaris didn't play well with. And so if they had had a staging server with Solaris on it, they would have saved literally weeks worth of rework. Now this is a simplistic test, or simplistic view of this. This can get pretty complicated. Now that's a screenshot of an actual pipeline. You know, there's eight source code repos and any number of other pipelines that have dependencies in between them. Um, this particular one is an open source product, and so there's certain things that we do on every pull request, but there's other things that only we control. And hey, we'll update the functional test, because those are harder to update and we get it. Uh, and so if you do a PR for this product, the unit tests all have to pass or we say go away. But if those pass, then and only then does it go any further, and eventually it gets to functional tests, and if those don't pass, we'll fix them. But we do that because it's in a separate source code repo, using separate materials. But this is all deployment of one product. And the funny thing on this one is, if I zoom into the end, it's really important, I believe, to let your teams decide what's the best thing to do for them from a risk perspective. This particular project has, I don't know, 12 or 15,000 automated tests. And so if we get a really bad performance thing, it shows up there. We have reporting and logging on how long it takes to run the functional test, and it shows up there that this took way longer. So they know. We do the big performance tests after production. Okay? That test costs $6,000 to run because it's using a whole lot of like Amazon machines that run for a very long time, and et cetera. And so this product releases once a month. It's an on-prem product, so more than that wouldn't be, um, wouldn't be acceptable. We've been watching the graphs of how long the, the functional tests are. We're pretty confident in the performance. And so we only run that test once a month. That's the right risk profile for this. Okay, if you're competing with Amazon, that's not the right risk profile. But you should be able to decide, and I highly recommend you let your teams decide what's the best for them. A mobile app has different requirements than an internal CRM app, for example. Also, don't be afraid to do little hidden things. Okay, that right there says security checks. I mentioned security already a little bit. Um, but again, this is a real open source product that's being built. And if you commit code, it builds uh, Linux and, and Windows. And while that's going, we're running Breakman to see if you put any gems in there that are, that are gonna cause no. There's bigger security tests later. But this is something that for our architecture, we could do quickly right at the beginning. So think of things like that. What are the things that you can do that are just a pass, no pass? If it breaks this, no, thou shalt not pass. Run it first. You know, there's, if you look at like the continuous delivery book or blogs or whatever, they all say unit test, then functional test, then blah, 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 blah. Um, that first stage has a whole bunch of Selenium functional tests in it. 
They're fast. They tell us what we need to know. What the heck? We put them in the first stage. Okay, you don't have to do it in the order of the, the book or whatever blog or whatever tells you to do it or I tell you to do it. Do it in whatever order you want to. So I talked about trunk-based development, you know, deploying or uh, putting all the code in the code base all the time. But I also said you have to be able to deploy right now. Well, if I have a feature that's half done, well, how do I do that? I can't deploy a feature that's half done. There's lots of ways to do that. And luckily, these are becoming more and more common. So I don't think much of this is going to be a huge shock. So first off, I want to differentiate between deploy and release. They are two different things. Okay? Deploy means put the software on the servers or on the app store or whatever. Release means make the software, the feature, available to the users or customers. I can have software that's deployed with features turned off. And so it's deployed, but it's not released. Okay? And then I can say on a big holiday, I say, oh, for, for whatever reason, I want to announce a thing uh, June 10th at, at GoTo. I could have this software deployed weeks ago. But somebody could go in and turn it on, and now we, hey, big announcement. Um, believe me, Apple does not deploy their new store when they release an iPhone. It's all ready to go. They flip a router. One of the more common ways to do that that is important if you're doing things like trunk-based development is a concept called feature toggles. And it's interesting because if you're, if you're writing down URLs or taking pictures, there's several slides on this, but the URL changes. Because that comes from a, a blog that Martin Fowler did in 2010. Um, and basically what it says is, I'm going to work on a new feature. The first thing I do is create a config file that says, is pet, pet survey true or false? And then in my code, I say, if it's true, here's the stuff. OK, so if, I, if my config file says off and I deploy that code, pet survey doesn't show up. If it's on, it turns on. So I can be running this in CI. I can have you know, parameters or however it is your CI system that says, OK, for these set of, turn, turn on and off for this set of tests. You may not want to do all of them, but I'm checking the code every single time. This can get very advanced. Uh, a guy by the name of Pete Hodgson did a follow-up article um, this year or late last year where he talks about some of the ways that we use feature toggles on real projects. And we do um, toggle routers, so databases that'll do things. They make decisions based on geography or browser, literal, or anything. And so you can get incredibly dynamic with these. And they become not just a way to be able to do trunk-based development, but also a way to test your business. So I can turn this feature on for some percentage of my clients and see if sales go up or down. If they go up, I keep working on the feature. If they go down, I turn it off. You know, so we want to do the right thing for the business. And this is one way to do that. There's lots of different things that we use toggles for pretty commonly. So it's a, sorry, the dynamic and the longevity. So lower left there is the release toggles. So those are the ones I'm talking about. We have a feature that's not done yet, and when it is done, we want to turn it on, see if it makes sales go up or down. If sales go down, we turn it off. Those don't live for very long, and they're very dynamic. Now, I want to be clear here. This is technical debt. It costs more to implement a feature, turning on a, and implementing feature toggles, than just doing the feature without them. And you, at this point, once you decide, yeah, I'm selling more widgets, you should go in and refactor and remove that code. And so that feature toggle is not there in there anymore. But it allows you to really test your assumptions and so forth. Um, and I'll just mention again, Knight Capital, which I'll get back to. Notice there's one, some experiments there that are very dynamic. So again, those can be based on geography, those kinds of things. I want to do an experiment and see how this plays in the Netherlands versus Germany. And do metrics. And it's all in the code. There might be permission toggles or operations toggles. Um, so everybody, is Netflix big here? I apologize. I should know the answer to this before I bring it up. Okay, so Netflix streaming video, what have you. Um, they have dynamic toggles for performance degradation. So if, if they get a performance hit, something happens, they'll turn off features automatically. One of the things the system does is when you log in, it recommends, hey, you might like this movie. The recommendation engine is the first thing it turns off. 
you can log in and stream the thing that's already in your playlist, but it's not going to do the computation required to recommend something. And they do that automatically based on the load on the system. So you can do those kinds of things, and it's just a toggle. Um, there's even some permission things up there. So the load on the system's 96. Nobody can even log in. Flip the permission toggle. Only people from Amsterdam are allowed to log in. Now you can get in. I mean, there's all kinds of things you can do for these things. So feature toggles are in code if statements. If on, do this. If off, do that. Okay, where that if comes from, it's a whole other story. So this is good for features, but what about like architecture changes? What about you know core libraries or what have you? There's another concept, and the title, the name of the concept is really poorly named. It's called branch by abstraction, but it's not actually a branch. So the idea is you have a component that you want to update. So let's say it's the, the well, here, I'll take one that we actually did on a project. We have a project that uses Ruby on Rails. It was Rails 2.3, and we wanted to upgrade it to Rails 4. That is a massive upgrade. Um, surely you can't do that on trunk, except for we did. Uh, so what you do is you have your consumers, so your different parts of the application that are talking to the thing, and you put an abstraction layer in the middle. So instead of talking directly to the thing, they talk to this abstraction layer, which then talks to the thing. And at first, it might be a one-to-one. -one. Okay. Then you can add the new component in there. And now new functionality has whatever logic to only talk to the new component. Old functionality uses the old component. And so you can, over time, do this. The, pro the product I was talking about was right in the middle of a Rails 2 to Rails 4 upgrade, which I don't know if there's any Ruby devs in here. That's big. There are lots of breaking changes. Right in the middle of that when a massive security, I don't remember if it was Heartbleed, but it was one of the OpenSSL ones came out. Huge. They were able to get a new release out in minutes because they updated a configuration file that updated the version of OpenSSL, ran through the entire pipeline, Rails 4 was turned off, and out it went. If you, on, if you downloaded that particular product and changed the configuration, and there's a configuration file, but it wasn't using a router because it was an on-prem product, changed the configuration file to Rails 4, Rails 4 and restarted it, it would come up. Half the stuff was broken, but it wasn't done, but it would come up. And so you can do that. Um, we did the same basic thing for a database layer on a different product. Um, these are ways that you can do things where you can only move what you have to move right now. Now, I also want to encourage you to think about your risk profile. Okay, so you know, if you're doing a, a website where people can do ratings on uh, you know, restaurants, it's an important business, but nothing's really going to happen if you know, a feature goes down or whatever. So you have to think about your risk. Um, and so I want to, pe people probably know about this, but let's do the, bring it up. Okay. So mean time between failures means I want to optimize to make it so I hardly ever fail. Mean time to recovery means I want to optimize so that when I do fail, not if, when, I can recover very quickly. Um, people who are really churning in continuous delivery almost never roll back because the changes are so small that I can roll forward. So I do a deployment, I have a problem, I fix it, which might mean actually fixing it, and it might be taking that code out, but then I do a new release. So I, I release version 12, it fails. I don't go back to 11, I deploy 13. It might be code identical to 11, but it's a roll forward. So now I have the history, I have the test that failed, I see what happened, there's an audit trail, auditors love this, um, those kinds of things. Now, if you're working on aircraft systems, as someone who flies well over 100,000 miles a year, please do mean time between failure. Okay, if you're doing restaurant reviews, mean time to recovery is probably okay. So it's something to keep in mind. There's also a whole bunch of deployment patterns that we can do for this. Um, and again, I know it's really fast. <laughs> um, but things you can look in to do it. If anybody's ever heard of canary releasing, Cool. So this one, nobody would raise their hand three or four years ago, but it was already fairly popular. That's where you deploy some number of systems with the new, for, new software, test it, and make sure it works. And if it works, you go to more, right? Most people do this with the actual deployment. So I'm going to deploy the new version to 5% of my servers. Run some metrics, run some tests, see which one works, et cetera, and then maybe deploy it to the rest. You can also do this with feature toggles. So I could deploy to all of them. 
but do the canary through toggles. It's a little bit safer, a little bit easier, and away you go. Dark launching is an interesting thing. My favorite dark launching story is Facebook. So a few years ago, um, Facebook in introduced a new feature where instant messaging, where you can message back and forth to your friends, and et cetera. And they had a problem. How do you load test 200 million users texting each other? It's kind of hard. <laughs> That's an expensive performance test. Well, the answer is you really can't. So they got to a minimum viable product, and the feature was in every version of Facebook. If you logged into Facebook, before Messenger was available for about a year almost, it was actually there. There was JavaScript in the browser that would execute, and it would message X percentage of your friends. And X percentage of them would answer you. And so they started it by rolling it out in Silicon Valley to Facebook employees, and then bigger, and all through toggles, by the way. And so eventually, for almost three months, every single user on Facebook, every time they logged in, was messaging 30% of their friends, or X percent. I may be wrong on the percentage. And some of those were answering. So they were load testing in production. When an anomaly would come up, they'd roll it back, they'd fix it, they'd do it again, they'd roll it back, they'd fix it, da da da, da. And so they did a huge splash, and Messenger is out, and everybody globally now has Facebook Messenger, and it was flawless. It worked for everybody. And, and a lot of people in IT were, how the heck did they do that? They did it because you've been using it the whole time. That's dark launching. It's fun. This one is relatively new. So everybody's probably familiar with GitHub, right? Hosted Git. Um, probably the, one of the most used features on Git is Git merge. Even if I'm doing trunk-based development, I, if I, I don't do a lot of code these days, I have to admit. But when I do, the first thing I do is git checkout dash b branch name. But you just said trunk. I'm going to push it back to master, but I'm going to work on a branch. And so when I got it, I got to merge it back in, right? So merge is something that, that most developers use a lot. But it was also really poorly written. Uh, a huge percentage of GitHub's resources were dedicated solely to merge. It was just not efficient at all. So they needed to fix it. But it's also something that a lot of us use a lot. And so they can't do any degradation of service. They can't make it so something that used to work doesn't work anymore. That there's just no tolerance for that. So what they did is they built version 2.0 of the library. And there's a whole thing there on GitHub engineering.com slash move dash fast. They built a different version of the library, and they ran them in parallel. Now, not you get that one and some people get this one. Every merge went through both. What actually got merged was the old library. What the new library did was capture a whole bunch of metrics and a bunch of tests, and how much faster was it, and did it work on this conflict, and did it work on that conflict. They actually found a whole bunch of edge cases in the original merge client they didn't know existed. They tried to merge something with 512 merge conflicts. Talk about a long-lived branch, but at any rate. Um, and it worked on the old client. Even though there was 512 conflicts, the merge went through. And it turned out there was something in there that any base of 256, the old client wouldn't catch. I mean, it's a weird edge case. But the point is that it's orders of magnitude faster. You were all using it if you use GitHub. And when they were really done done, then they just flipped them over, and now everybody got the new one. Um, and so again, it's something that you, you, you have a business that's core to somebody. Somebody needs this to work every time they run it. Um, so not a high risk profile. You can use t things like this. I also want to encourage you when you're doing all these things to create useful feedback loops. Okay, so a pipeline, all of these things. The point is to give the team the feedback they need to do their work. This test failed, this test didn't, the business went up because of, you know, et cetera. That requires useful logging. Okay? Purchase failed is not useful. It's, you know, the, the exception from the credit card handler, you know, et cetera. So yeah, I saw one of the earlier talks talked about, you know, the right amount of logging, et cetera. But it has to be useful logging. Don't be afraid to run some of your tests in production if you're that kind of environment where you can do that. If you're a web-based app or SaaS or, you know, what have you, um, after you do your deployment, run some of your functional tests. Um, you know, don't be careful creating data and, you know, that kind of stuff. But 
There's a lot of things that you can test in production that you just, you know, dark launching, that you just, even the best staging environment, you just really can't duplicate real world. And so do that. On par with the, oops, sorry. Time for either a new or an old clicker. OK. On par with logging, also make sure your alerts are useful. So um, I draw a strong differential between DevOps, which I believe is culture. I don't think you can do DevOps. And continuous delivery, which is the technical practices that you do. I often say extreme programming is too agile as DevOps is to continuous delivery, or as continuous delivery is to DevOps, sorry. Um, part of the whole DevOps culture is, you know, you build it, you run it. So now people that didn't used to get paged at 3 in the morning are getting paged at 3 in the morning. If I get paged at 3 in the morning, it says 5% of my production cluster is down, but performance is still where it's supposed to be. That is a useless page. I'm not going to go do anything about it, right? So we put logic in your alerting system also that says, what are the things I actually need to wake somebody up for? Um, and what are the things that I don't? Useful. Night capital. Uh, risk management, right? So I mentioned that one of the things about feature toggles is that it's tech debt and you got to go clean them up. They didn't. Knight Capital is a trading firm that did a low number of high value trades. So normally when you talk to a trading system, if someone's trading on, on NASDAQ or the London Stock Exchange or whatever, they're all about how many transactions per second can I do. They didn't care. Okay, their thing was, we're doing a low number of transactions, relatively speaking, but they're a large value. So they decided to build a function that would watch the stock that they were trading and say, if it changes X percentage of the time, notify somebody so they can say, ooh, I need to buy or sell. Make a decision based on that information. The problem was, six years ago, they used the same toggle name for a feature that would automatically execute some orders. They deployed the new software to seven out of their eight machines. The eighth one started trading real stock. Four million executions, 154 stocks, 397 in the time it took me to do this talk. How much money do you think they lost? Anybody been wondering what that number is the whole time? In 45 minutes, Knight Capital lost $440 million. Their market cap was 400. Bye bye. Um, other people came in and took the company over. Uh, if they had had an automated test that tested toggles, never would have happened. Okay, they had a risk profile that meant all their security tests, all of their toggle tests, everything needed to be run every single time, and they didn't do it. And a whole lot of people lost a whole lot of money. One of the keynotes today was about like in vehicles and whatever. Money is bad. Somebody running into a tree because the car didn't turn, that's worse. Okay? Code kills these days. We have to do these things. To summarize, if you don't have a system that you can go hit deploy, literally right now, it's not continuous delivery yet. Doesn't mean you're not on the journey. Okay? CI habits are absolutely fundamental. You have to have them. Feature toggles are one way, the others, et cetera. 